Pastor Mark Connor is going to come and, and preach to us, which is a great privilege. Um, uh, Mark was a uh, pastor at City Life for like, well, you worked at City Life for like 32 years or something like that. Is that right? A long time. Um, and he was senior pastor for a, a good proportion of that, most of that. Um, I remember you, Mark. One, I remember going to what they called WCF at the time, Waverley Christian Fellowship, in the, the old part of the, new, the, the building. And I remember uh, Ted Fabi Fabianic preaching and you playing piano. And that was when I was a boy. And, 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 I, and, and it, it moved me that night. I, can, I still can remember because it was like just the understanding that, that the, the Holy Spirit is alive and there is some way that I can communicate that is real and in imminent and right now. It's not just head knowledge, it's real and connected. And uh, so, look, please come and uh, bring us the word and we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. How are we doing there, Kenneth? Coming on, coming on. Thank you very much for your welcome. Good to be here. Clayton Church of Christ. What a great church. Oh, yeah. I was talking about you, not the building. <laughs> Should be a great church because you're a part of it. Uh, really, really good to uh, be a part of the camp this weekend and to uh, be able to share a few things with you tonight and tomorrow morning. Am I better back here a little bit? That's good. I'll just keep talking and Kenneth will figure it out. So um, thank you very much for your welcome, Chief R and Eugenia and uh, Paul and Sim and, and all the team here. Great to, great to be a part of it. Uh, I'm uh, a little bit of background. I'm married to Nicole now for 35 years. Married very young, of course. And uh, we have uh, three adult children who are all married now. Got a couple of grandkids, uh, four grand dogs. And so um, enjoying family life. As Paul mentioned, I was on staff at uh, City Life for, yeah, 35 years. I was involved in worship ministry for a while. And then I was youth pastor for about five years with Nicole. And then I was administrator for a year and then uh, senior pastor for uh, about 22 years. So that was uh, up to about five years ago. So the last five years I've been doing some coaching and training and uh, I have the privilege of doing a little bit of speaking at different churches as we are this weekend. So great to be together with you. I've also written a couple of books and I bought a few resources that will be available just over on the table there at the end. So I'll do this real quickly. We'll get into the message. Uh, when I was at City Life, we did a survey for the congregation and one of the questions was, I wish someone would preach about... And we left it blank, and we collected all the answers, and I had enough to preach on until Jesus returns. But I was interested. People wanted to hear about stuff we weren't preaching on. Uh, people wanted to hear about how do I break free from worry? How do I deal with anger? How do I deal with depression? How do I deal with fear? And so we put a whole series together called Prison Break, Finding Personal Freedom. And it's one of the most impacting series we ever did. And so we ended up putting that in a book. A lot of churches have used that for series. So I've got that there. Um, I've got another book here. You know, a little tip. Uh, pastors get nervous about two topics. One is sex and one is money. Um, I'll leave the sex talk for your local team. But <laughs> I've done a book called Money Talks. And uh, it's not just about giving. It's about earning and saving. And what about investing? Investments, has a whole chapter on business, and so that's a book about money. I've got another book on how to avoid burnout, five habits of healthy living, for all of you who are trying to change the world by the end of June. And I also have another book called The Spiritual Journey, which looks at different stages of faith. So uh, drop by at the end, come and say hello. There's a couple of resources there for you. Um, who, let me start here, who's become a Christian in the last 12 months? Last 12 months, anyone here become a Christian during that time? Last two years? Anyone become a Christian in the last two years? Anyone a Christian here at all? <laughs> hey, Tim, would you, would you help me out, Tim? Uh, man in the really cool yellow jacket, that'll help you on your journey of faith. Off you go. Uh, do I have any business owners here? Anyone running your own business? You know what that's like? Up the back there, this is for you. Don't burn out. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy. <laughs> Do I have any final year university students? Yeah. Money talks. Here you go. Now you get to go and earn some money. Tim, uh, Tim can you help me? Tim does a lot of things. He chairs the board, but he's also brilliant at lots of things. i got one more book. I'm feeling this is for a grandmother. Is there any grandmothers in the room? Any grandmothers? Everyone's putting your hand up for you. There's a book there for you. Give these people a big clap. 
Enjoy. Let's pray. God, it's been really good to be together tonight to worship you, to hear stories of your work in our lives. And as we uh, open your word now, I really pray that you would use me to speak to every person in the room in a very personal and powerful way. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. 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 If you'd like to take notes, tonight we're going to talk about discovering your life purpose. Discovering your life purpose. I wonder if you can kind of transport back in your mind to when you were in primary school. For some of you, that's not long ago. For some of you, it's very last century. Um, Primary school. In primary school, if someone came up to you and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I wonder how you would have answered that question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, Anyone want to yell out what you wanted to be back in primary school? A police person. Top gun. Very in vogue. Someone else? A pilot, a movie star? Any, any? A NASCAR driver. Anyone? Astronaut? No, no astronauts. That's all right. Evangelist. There you go. Maybe you wanted to be a pastor. Uh, You know, some people, when you're young, you're very clear about what you want to become. Others aren't real sure. Sometimes those dreams become a reality. Sometimes they don't. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. Uh, For a while, I wanted to be a naturalist because the kid across the road had a lot of animals. So I thought I wanted to be a naturalist. And so I got this run in the backyard with a couple of long-necked turtles and a couple of blue-tongued lizards. And I was going to be a naturalist. Unfortunately, one turtle escaped and the other one died. So I kind of... Lost that particular hope. Then I wanted to be an architect, but my handwriting wasn't very neat. And then I wanted to be a cabinet maker, and I did a week's work experience, and all I did was shave up wood shavings, uh, sweep up wood shavings. So I kind of lost interest in that. Uh, and through my journey, I had many different jobs from building renovator, assistant to bookbinding, music, youth, and eventually church leadership. Uh, you know, we're all different. We're all on a journey, and we have different aspirations. One thing I've discovered, I've never I've never met anyone who, when they were young, their aim in life was to be useless. I've never found anyone who said, when I grow up, I want to be useless. You know, every one of us want to be useful. And I think God has put that in the human heart. Whoever you are here tonight, there's this inbuilt desire to be useful, to to do something with our life, to do something significant, maybe even to make a difference, the great stories we heard tonight. And I believe God put that there. And so when we talk about discovering our life purpose, we we want to begin with God, our creator. Um, I believe your purpose is something you discover more than something you decide. Let me say that again. Your purpose is something that you discover more than something you decide. You know, sometimes we have these really lovely motivational statements. Maybe you've heard this one. Have you ever heard this one? You can be anything you want to be. Anyone ever heard that? You ever heard that? Is that true? Well, just watch some of the singing talent shows and you'll discover that that's just not true for everybody. Some people want to be a star, but it's like, you know, your grandmother loves your voice, but maybe not everybody else. (laughs) You can't be everything or anything you want to be, but you can be what God has created you to be. And so if you're a follower of Jesus here tonight, then every one of us have been saved. Everyone say saved. Saved. And called. Everyone say called. called. Every follower of Jesus has been saved and called. Now, if we've only been saved, how many know we might as well go to heaven right now? Like, if all we're here to is be saved, then what, what are we doing? Let's go to heaven right now. When we baptize people, we might as well just hold them under a little bit longer <laughs> till all the bubbles are gone, straight to heaven, no backsliding. If you're visiting, if you're visiting, they don't do that here at Clayton. <laughs> No, 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 we're not just saved. We are saved and called with a holy calling. Not just up in heaven when we die, but right here on earth. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. On to the next slide. Thanks, Errol. I love the scripture, Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. Why don't we read this in a loud voice in unison? Here we go. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done so that no one can boast about it. Let's just pause there. Notice the salvation part of our life. It's a gift of grace, as we so beautifully heard in the worship time tonight. You know, God's love for you is not based on your performance. 
It's not based on how well you're doing or what kind of a week you have. Uh, God's love for you as his child is based simply on the fact that you are his child. You know, we know this in our head, but getting that into our heart can be quite transformative. I remember when I first became a parent, our oldest son is Josiah. When he was born, I remember holding him in my hands, a little redhead boy, and I was so excited to be a dad. And I was just holding him. I was thinking how much I loved him. Like, you know, take the car, take the house, take my job, but don't take my little boy. And as I was holding him, I started to think why I loved him so much. He hadn't kicked a goal yet on a sports team. He hadn't scored an A on a test. And he hadn't made any money. In fact, it cost us a lot of money just to get him right here. <laughs> he hadn't done anything, but I loved him more than anything in my world. Now, if I as a human, flawed, sinful father feel that about my children, how, how, how do you think God feels about you? It, it's not about how many goals you've kicked, how many A's you've scored. How much, it's got nothing to do with your performance. The salvation part is a free gift from God. That's why Christianity is very different from most religions. You know, most religions are spelled do, D-O, do this, and then you'll be okay. Christianity is spelt done. Everyone say amen. Done. It's about what Jesus has already done for us. And so this is the salvation part. But we keep reading into verse 10 onto the next slide. But we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So remember, we don't do things in order to be loved by God. We already are loved by God. We've already been saved by grace. But now that we've been saved, we have a calling. We have some things that God has prepared us to do. The Greek word for masterpiece there, some translations say workmanship or handiwork. The Greek word is the Greek word poema from which we get the word poem. It literally means you are a work of art. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, you are a work of art. Don't say you're a piece of work. <laughs> no, no, no. You are a work of art. You want me to change across to that? Okay. You are a work of art. God is shaping you uniquely, like an artisan, like a craftsman. He's shaping you. You are his workmanship. You are his handiwork. And uh, that, that's why we're all so unique. We're being created and made into something very special. So as a result, let's look at Ephesians 6 verse 4 now in the Message Bible onto our next slide. Because of this... We should make a careful exploration of who you are. That's your salvation. I'm a child of God. He loves me just the way I am. Explore who you are and the work you have been given and then sink yourself into that. Can you see this rhythm of salvation and calling? Who I am and what I've been called to do. And so we've got to make an effort. We've got to explore not only who we are, but what is the work that you have been given and then sink yourself into that. And so as you arrived on this planet, as you came to faith in Jesus, what is God put in your suitcase. Take some time to explore that, to discover what your purpose is. A couple of decades ago, an American pastor named Rick Warren uh, put together a little acronym that I think helps us in discovering our purpose, and it's the word SHAPE. The word shape, you might have heard this before, but our shape refers to five things. Let's look at them very briefly together tonight. Firstly, spiritual gifts. Every one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have one or more spiritual gifts. And throughout the New Testament, you'll find lists of them in 1 Corinthians and Romans and Peter. Uh, gifts of serving, gifts of teaching, gifts of encouragement and giving and leading and showing mercy and administration. How many know administration is a gift of the Holy Holy Spirit. All the organized people should have said amen there. Gifts of hospitality, gifts of teaching and prophecy and healing. There's a whole range of gifts and every one of you have been given one or more spiritual gifts. And your spiritual gifts aren't a ministry, they're actually tools to use in the ministry that you are to be involved in. And so you need to discover 
and develop and then deploy your spiritual gifts. Letter H stands for your heart. Your heart is what you kind of beat fast about. What, what, what are your passions? What, what, what are your desires? What, what do you enjoy doing? These are really good questions to ask yourself as you're seeking to discover your purpose. What do you enjoy doing? What, what, what do you care about? Uh, what do you get excited about? What, what, what energizes you? You know, if you, if you care about something, if you're excited about something, if you're energized about something, then that's telling us where your heart is directed. That's a link to your purpose. Here's an interesting one. What makes you angry? You know, sometimes anger is an insight to your contribution. If you get really angry at disorganized things, guess what? Maybe you've got a gift of administration. Are you with me? If you hate disorder, then maybe you've been created to bring some order into the chaos. If you hate boring and predictable, boring, predictable, maybe you've got creative gifts to help bring color to God's world. Are you following me? The very, if you get annoyed at injustice, if you get angry at people being overlooked or unfairness, or you know, if you get annoyed at those things, that could be a clue to the contribution God has given you to make. And so take a little time to reflect on your spiritual gifts, to look at your heart. Where does your heart beat? Where are your emotions kind of directed? Letter A refers to our abilities. And this, every one of us have abilities, strengths, things that we're good at, things that we're effective at. We're, we're not good at everything. If you're a parent, how many know not every kid is academic? Thank you for that underwhelming response. <laughs> if you're a parent, not every kid is athletic. And not every kid is musical. It's just the way it is. You're not good at everything, but maybe you are musical. Maybe you are academic. Maybe you are creative. Maybe you're a team builder. Maybe you're good with money. Maybe you're good with, with things, a a a abilities. Have you taken some time to reflect on your abilities? Letter P is our personality. We've all got unique personalities, introverts, extroverts. Some like to work with people, some with things. Some are leaders, some are managers. Some like to pioneer, some like to settle. Some are linear thinkers, some are random thinkers. We're just all different. You know, my wife and I, um, we have a lot in common, but, but we're very unique. You know, if you put me in Melbourne's central business, business district, you know, the grid, King William, Queen Elizabeth, I, I always know what I am in the city. Nicole gets lost in the city, which just boggles my mind. How can you get lost? Like, it's so simple. Flinders, uh, Collins, Little Collins, Burke, Little, like, like, it's so simple. But you know what? If you go up to the Dandenongs where everything curves, you got Sassafras and Alinda, I am always lost in the Dandenongs. You could put Nicole in contrast on any curved road and she'll immediately know where we are. <laughs> totally different brain, totally different wiring. Random, creative versus linear and structured. And so what's your personality? How, don't try to be somebody else. Who are you? What is your unique shape? And then letter E is our experience. You know, nothing in your past is wasted. Did, did we hear that amazing story tonight? What, what a horrible thing to observe someone attempting to commit suicide. N nothing is wasted. Even your pain, even your difficulty. Sometimes your mess ends up becoming your message, doesn't it? Sometimes the pain you experience or go through becomes part of your purpose. Nothing is wasted in life. Everything you have gone through contributes to, to who you are and possibly to the contribution God wants you to make. And so have you taken some time not just to enjoy our salvation, but to think about your calling. How are you shaped? Let me give you an example here. Anyone know what this is? Ice cream, Ice cream scoop. Some of you are getting ready for dessert already. I think this is one of the most brilliant inventions in the human race. I'm not sure how many bent spoons scattered the globe until someone came up with an idea about how to scoop ice cream without bending the spoon. And so they invented the ice cream scoop. And let me tell you, this baby will not bend. 
Doesn't matter how hard your ice cream is, that's going to go in there and scoop it out. It's an amazing invention. Now, uh, here's my point. There's a lot of things you could do with this ice cream scoop. You could use it as a hammer. You could weed your garden with it. You could throw it. No, no, no I'm only kidding. Um, you could use it as a paperweight. There's a lot of things you could use this ice cream scoop for. But you know what? It's most effective when you use it for the purpose in which the designer created it. It's been shaped for a purpose. You know, you're the same. There's a lot of things you could do with your life. But when you take the time to reflect on and discover how you've been shaped, the truth is you'll be most effective and most joyful when you function in the way in which God has uniquely shaped you to contribute. The opposite is true. If you try to be something you're not, if you try to do th things that you're not really gifted and skilled and created to, then you're going to be frustrated and everyone else is going to be frustrated, like a round peg in a square hole. And so it's vital that we not only rejoice in our salvation, but that we take time to discover our calling. Uh, another way to look at it is if you could think about the things you care about, the things that you're good at, and the needs of the world, in the middle of that Venn diagram of three things is your mission. What are you good at? What do you care about? What are the needs of the world? How many of you know some things you're good at you don't care about anymore? <laughs> Some things you care about you're not really good at, but if you could find out what you care about and what you're good at and match that with the needs of the world, you've got that sweet spot, that zone of calling and contribution. Peter picks this up. Let's look at the next slide. Thanks, Errol. First Peter 4 verse 10, God has given each of you, not just a few, not just the, the board, not just the upfront leaders, God has given each of you, every one of you in the room, at least one, not all, a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use, say the word use with me. One more time with a bit more enthusiasm. Use it. It's one thing to have the gifts and go, wow, I've been given this, 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 this. No. Discover those gifts, but use them well to serve one another. And so as we discover our purpose, then we want to live on purpose. And how do we do that? Let's just apply this in our last few minutes together. You know, your purpose is lived out uh, through every day of your life wherever you may find your play, your, 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 yourself. It, it starts at home. You know, in your home, you have a ministry. And the way God has shaped you, it starts by serving right there in your home. Uh, it it continue, continues out to, to our neighborhood, to our local community, to your school or to your university, to your workplace. You know, the, the Great Commission is not just go into all nations, ethnos, people groups. It's to go into all the world. And the Greek word for world is cosmos, which means the social order that exists. And so as we go out, not just geographically, but some of us are in the legal profession, some of us are in education, some of us might be in sports and entertainment, others of us might be uh, in, in other professions and building and construction. And, and every social order that exists, the Great Commission is not just come and see, it's not just go to to other nations, but it's go to every strata of society and bring good news. And, and so our ministry is lived out wherever we are. And so the world should be a better place because you and I are there. You know, one day when our life is over, we'll be asked two questions, basically. What did you do with Jesus? That, that's a salvation question. But what did you do with your life? God's looking for a return on the investment, the way he's shaped you. And so I pray that you'll be able to say that, yes, you knew Jesus, but that you served wherever you were, that you used your gifts and your heart and your passion, and wherever you were, you contributed to making the world a better place with the love of Jesus. And then the second place that we live at our purpose, not only in the world, in the cosmos, in wherever we find ourselves during the week, but also we live at our purpose as part of the church. And each Christian is a member of 
Christ's body and has a job to do. And uh, in the kingdom of God, there should be no unemployment. Uh, no unemployment. Every one of us have a contribution to make to the church. And in many ways, the church is a body with many members. Uh, the church is also like a team with everyone contributing. And it's, it's not meant to be just a few doing all the work, but every one of us have a contribution to make. Uh, you know, Moses was the first one-man band. Any, anyone remember Moses? He, he was pastor of the church in the wilderness, and uh, it was a big church, a couple hundred thousand people. Uh, it, it wasn't a real nice church like you, like they were grumbling all the time. In fact, some days Moses wanted to kill them, remember that? And, and God's saying, no, Moses, you can't do that. Uh, other days, God wanted to kill them, and Moses is going, no, God, no, God, you can't do that. It's a good thing for Israel that God and Moses didn't have a bad day on the same day. <laughs> it, it was not a nice congregation, but, but you know, Moses was doing it all himself. He was counseling everybody. There were long lines of people. He was wearing himself out, and the people weren't getting looked after. And thankfully, his father-in-law, Jethro, had a word of wisdom and said, Moses, you've got to spread the load. You've got to raise up. You've got to build a team. You've got to involve more people in the ministry. Uh, unfortunately, some, some churches, uh, it's the few that do everything. Uh, a, a healthy church is where everyone gets involved in the work of ministry. Uh, a simple example, I, I, love, uh, I love basketball. And let's say you went to a basketball game and uh, it's the saints versus the demons. Who are we cheering for? Just, just checking. And so it's the saints versus the demons. And so you, you get your popcorn and you sit down on the sideline and you're hoping the saints can have a win today. And so the game starts. And what happens is all the saints players sit on the sideline and they send the coach out all by himself. And so the coach is there, does jump ball, and, and is guarding all of the demons, is throwing it to himself, and, and all, the, all the players are on the sideline going, come on coach, come on coach. The coach is doing his very best, but there's just so many demons that they're scoring goal after goal. Eventually the coach faints and they stretch him off, and then they send the assistant coach out. <laughs> now, now, if you were a spectator watching this team, what would you think? What, what, a, what a stupid team. I mean, all the Saints players are sitting on the sideline and they're sending the pastor to pray to play all by himself. You know, a lot of churches are just like that. Not Clayton, but other churches. Pastor greets you at the front door. Hello, everybody. Gets at the front, plays the guitar, makes the announcements, does the offering, preaches, prays for people, catches people if necessary, goes to the front door and says, thanks for coming. See you next week. And we wonder why so many pastors are burning out. Your, your ministry is not to sit on the sidelines and cheer the few leaders on. Thank God for halftime. And I think the church is in a bit of halftime now where leaders are realizing our job isn't to do it all. And, and congregations are realizing our job is not just to cheer the leaders on, but maybe if we can get everyone out on the field, out on the court, maybe we can turn this around in the second half. Amen? And so unless you're injured or in training, we, we need everybody involved in the game contributing. Now, not everyone's going to be prominent. Not everyone's going to be up on the microphone or out the front. There's many significant ministries that aren't profiled. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll meet someone at church and I'll say, hey, hey, where are you helping out? And they say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just a kid's volunteer. Never say I'm just a kid's volunteer. My best kid's ministry story is uh, apparently D.L. Moody was having a, a big meeting and someone said after the meeting, how'd it go? And he says, yeah, really good. Two and a half people got saved. Someone said, oh, what, what, two adults and, and a child? He says, no, 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 two children and an adult. <laughs> the, life's, the, the adult's life is half over. The kids have their whole life ahead of them. Never say, I'm just a kid's worker. What, 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 a, what an important ministry. Never say, I'm just an usher. My best usher story is apparently years ago, there was a big tent meeting on, and it was packed out, and two teenagers tried to get a seat, and they couldn't get into the tent, and so they started walking home. An usher saw them say, hey, don't go. Let me find you a seat. The usher pushed in and found these two teenagers a seat in the meeting. You know, one of those teenagers' name was Billy Graham. Never say I'm just an usher. 
You know, we, we won't all be prominent, we won't all be up front, but every one of us is significant, no matter what place we get involved. And, and, and so what's your ministry? What's your contribution? You know, and, and then some things just need to be done. You know, you know, at home, if my teenager says, you know what, I, I, I don't want to take out the rubbish, I just don't feel it's my gifting. It's, it's <laughs> like it's not my calling, you know. My heart doesn't beat for the rubbish. You know, there's some things you do just because they need to be done. And, and it's the same in church life too. And so as we wrap this up today, discovering your life purpose, well, what, what, what about you here today? Have you taken the time to reflect on your calling and, and your unique shape? Have you thought about how God has made you? You know, there'd be a bunch of you that have done so and you're using your gifts right now in the world, in the marketplace and at church. And I just want to say, well done, well done. Uh, God is pleased because you're saved and called and you're living out that calling. Or, or secondly, maybe some of you know your gifts, but right now you're not using them for some reason. You know, maybe an opportunity hasn't come your way. Maybe you're in a time of transition. Maybe you're kind of between ministries or maybe you're a little bit burnt out. Sometimes we just get a little tired and we need a little bit of a, a break just, just to sit on the sidelines to catch our breath. That, 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 that's okay. Just don't stay on the sidelines forever. You know, catch your breath and, and, and get back engaged. And, and then finally, maybe some of you just aren't sure at all. You're, you're still on that journey of discovery, finding out your new, unique shape. Whoever you are today, I, I just know this. God's hand is on Clayton Church of Christ. We've got a, a great history, a great heritage, but more importantly, a great future. And that future involves every one of you to realize I, I've been saved, but, but I have a calling. I have a contribution. It's only as all of us contribute that we'll see that, that great vision, that great mission for our church achieved. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, tonight for our salvation. And wow, what a, what a free gift that is, not based on our performance, not based on how well we're doing. We are your children just because you chose to have us in your family. May, may we know, know that incredible grace today. May we know who we are. Uh, set us free from all striving tonight, all struggling to measure up, to feel like we're never good enough. Lift off guilt and shame tonight for each one of us just to celebrate the joy of our salvation. And Lord, for those that know their shape, that are using their gifts, that are contributing, Lord, I just I commend them today. May they know a, an amazing joy, an amazing fruitfulness uh, over the second half of this year as they serve in the marketplace, at home, and in the church. Lord, Lord, I'm praying for others here today that know their gifts, but for some reason they're just not using them right now. Maybe a, an opportunity hasn't come. Maybe they're in that transition. Maybe they're just catching their breath. Lord, today, speak to them, minister to them. And finally, I pray for those that are on that journey of discovery that aren't quite sure yet. Lord, that they just get out of the boat. Take a step of faith. Just begin to serve. Sometimes we find out what we're not good at first. And so I pray you'd give them the courage just to begin serving, just to begin getting involved in, in the work that you've given us as a church. And so I pray a huge blessing on Clayton Church of Christ, that this would be a, a church family where every one of us discover our purpose. Every one of us live out our salvation and our calling. And as a result, the world will be a better place. And we'll be sure to give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. 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 Give God a big clap today. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, um, can we give Pastor Mark a, a hand again? Thank you, Mark. Um, so what we're going to do right now is um, we're going to put up Mentimeter again, okay? Uh, again, it's not about surveying, but it's about for us to use it as a tool to discern how God is speaking to each and every one of you, yeah? Now, we've shared this uh, earlier today, that as each of us step into our individual calling, we will then discover our collective expression as this church. And so you can take out your phones, take a copy of that QR code, it'll take you into the survey, okay? So we're going to keep that up there and um, for a little bit longer so that everyone has access to that. It, we'll just give this some time. Okay. 
Yeah. Great. So as you're doing that, it's going to lead into two sets of questions, okay? So the first set of questions is um, areas about where you feel called to, okay? We've got a drop-down list of a whole bunch of different things from like marketplace, uh, your workplace, your family, uh, the global unreached place, the local community. Um, so where do you think God has called you for this season based on your gifting? In the way that he has made you okay so you can rank it in terms of priority but we want you to rank your top three okay so try and rank your top three yeah so that's just a bit of a prompter question and as you guys kind of list it you'll start seeing that live right now um, the outcome of that yeah Great. Keep going. Okay, cool. Family, friends, workplace. I really like that. You know, our vision is to build disciples who represent Jesus to everyone, everywhere, and everything. Um, we need it in the church, <laughs> right? But it's beyond that. Right? Monday to Saturday, yeah? So I really, really like that. I think it's fantastic. Wonderful. So as a team, we'll kind of try and look at this and pull it together. Um, but this is a good expression about what God is kind of putting upon your heart and where we sit as a church in this room, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we need to put some elderly ministry right there. <laughs> Yeah, I did it wasn't all the work. <laughs> okay. That's pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to go to the second question, okay? Uh, if you can turn to the next slide. A very simple question. I feel called to. Okay? Now, before you answer this, I want to share some stuff. So, for example, I met a guy... His name is Sensenjaya, okay? So he's an Indonesian guy. He plants at an Indonesian church near Clayton, but he's bivocational. But he's actually a leadership professor at Swinburne University. He was one of the key pioneers to actually uh, spearhead um, academia in servant leadership. And he shares and teaches about gospel impact on leadership. Isn't it amazing? Right? That's an expression of him feeling called to. Why? Because he had four really bad bosses. <laughs> and then his shape was academia. Research. He wanted to influence the thinkers. And in so doing, it kind of led to this, uh, you know, call to express how God has shaped him to make an influence and to bring a gospel influence. And now there's so much more academia around servant leadership. Right? And I think as a church, we need to gain ground again and be front-footed, right? On so many of these different kind of areas and spheres in society, not be back-footed, front-footed. Amen? Yeah? And so when I say I feel called to, I don't just mean like, you know, um, 
just within the church sphere, but I want you to think specifically. I think what Pastor Mark has shared has been particularly helpful. Think through the shape, spiritual gifts, hearts, abilities, you know, experience your personality. Think carefully about it and then just write. Okay? Just write that down. I feel called to. Yeah? Let's just give this some time. And I don't want us to kind of over, kind of, you know, even that statement, you know, I want to represent Jesus to everyone I know is our vision, right? But um, Auntie Swan had a chance to actually share and pray for someone uh, on staff here on, cam- on this campus, right? And managed to have an opportunity to bring Christ into that moment, into that life. That lady was seeking again, and she was just crying, and it was just, can't believe it was the right word, right season. Amen? We were talking about it, and bang, straight away it happened, right? It was amazing, right? And you never know, as you take each of those steps representing Christ, God begins to make it known what your sense of call is, yeah? But where you can be specific also, where you do know, be specific, yeah? Okay, well, as that's kind of flowing up, I just want to invite maybe... A handful of people, uh, maybe for you to be able to express that sense of call. Yeah, unless like just.